Hello everyone and welcome to the Public Salon. My name is Daniel Ramadan. I'm the writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library and I would like to welcome you to this bi-monthly series where I invite uh, up-and-coming authors from Saskatoon to read their fantastic poetry to you. Before I begin, I want to say that I'm broadcasting from the Coast Salish people territories, the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I'm broadcasting all the way to you on the Treaty 6 uh, territories, the, the land of the Métis people in Saskatoon. I want to affirm that um, myself and the Saskatoon Public Library are committed to reconciliation and to recognizing our role in the um, navigation of, of uh, this land, specifically myself as an uninvited guest on this land, as a newcomer who came here six years ago. Today, I have a fantastic group of folks for you to uh, hear their work. I'm going to go with uh, Donald B. Campbell. I'm going to invite Delane uh, Just and Ian Cannon. The folks have sent me their work and I read it and I loved it and I cannot wait to share it with you. So let's get started with Donald B. Campbell. Donald B. Campbell is a Saskatoon English as a second language teacher. His plays have been performed in Saskatchewan and Alberta. He's also an actor and a director. His great writing and journalism has appeared in magazines, an anthology of prairie humor, and on provincial and national CBC radio. And I leave you today with Donald B. Campbell as my very first guest as the public salon. Hi, I'm Donald B. Campbell, and this is my story, CJOHQ, October. Leaves and wood burning in a barrel outside. A dirt floor that feels cool and hard through the seat of my jeans. The smooth perfection of a saw blade as I slide an index finger along its top edge. My father's closed jackknife bounces in the other palm. Its rhythm slows my breath. Fire crackles in the barrel as if delicate bones were breaking. From the tool shed, I can smell and taste it. My model ship is a Viking funeral pyre without a body. The popsicle sticks become ashes. No one will know I tried to copy Dad's larger, sturdier model, especially not Big Schmidt and Little Schmidt. My hands remember how everything in the shed felt. I close my eyes and I'm there. I'm 10, 24 years ago, 30 months after Dad hugged me so hard it hurt. He didn't look back at us on his way to the car. 10. 24, 30, all even numbers. Jason, are you in the shed? I made a pumpkin pie, it's still warm. What are you burning? You shouldn't spend the whole weekend in that dusty old... I covered my ears and turned mum's voice into waves crashing in the distance. Now it's winter. I stare out my office window at a snowbank to clear my head. Maybe I can drain the memories of their color and shape replace them with a long stretch of white so stark that it must be pure, or freeze them out, lie on top of the snowbank and watch the clouds of my breath disappear. Are you busy, Mr. Schmidt? It takes me a heartbeat to remember I I'm supposed to be Mr. Schmidt. This is our administrative assistant, Mrs. Franklin. She's my age, but insists on Mrs. It goes with her pearl earrings and long skirts. When I was nine, mom went from Mrs. McNally to Mrs. Schmidt. She made me give up two things I loved, half of my bedroom to make space for my stepbrother, half of my name to make Henry Schmidt the head of his expanded family. There had to be a mathematical error. Two halves add up to one, a number far too small for what I'd lost. I love math. You can always get the right answer if you know the rules and focus on the details. I remember carving numbers in the dirt floor of the shed, tracing their lines with my finger over and over until it seemed like they were part of my hand. My favorite was five, odd and prime. I loved the curve at the bottom after the harsh straight lines above. It reminded me of my fifth birthday. Just before I went to sleep, dad carved a five on my headboard with his jackknife. I don't want to nag, Mr. Schmidt, but I need both partner signatures. I know. I hate it when she calls a little Schmidt my partner. A dog barks in the parking lot. 
I close my eyes. I'm nine and two thirds. Be nice to your new brother. Let him walk, buddy. Okay, Jason, are you listening? I rubbed my bare toes along the smooth kitchen tiles. My mother's long, cool fingers brushed a lock of hair from my eyes. He seems like a stranger now, but he's a great kid. He likes you. You're, you're lucky to have a little brother. Look at me. My eyes focused on the pattern of her skirt. If I stared hard enough, one of the sunflowers would start growing. Get bigger and bigger and brighter till you burn like the sun. Burn the house, the garage, Henry Schmidt's shit brown station wagon. Burn everything but the tool shed. That's where I always went to think. It was close to the backyard fence, so I pictured it sailing out into the alley. A ship to carry Jason on his quest. A few days after my father left, I found his jackknife and carved C-J-O-H-Q on the bottom inside edge of the door. I made the letters small enough so mom wouldn't notice. They felt huge when I ran my fingers over them in the dark, half dark of sunny afternoons. Dad used to say that he and mom named me Jason because his father played for the Toronto Argonauts. I didn't understand until my eighth birthday. He gave me Adventures in Mythology, hardcover with 239 pages, odd and prime. Every night I stayed up late reading in a bed with a flashlight, the way most kids read comic books. Someday I'll be strong enough to go on a quest. No more homework, no chores, no lecture about my new brother, just the open sea. I convinced myself that dad was searching for the golden fleece and he'd be home soon. Mom said he's searching for the province with the lowest liquor prices. The only times I remember him drinking were special occasions, like the anniversary party they had two weeks before he left. How can adults love people one day and hate them the next? They're supposed to be smarter than kids. At first, I got postcards from him and followed his journey away from the prairies on my globe. Mountains in Banff National Park, peach trees near Kelowna, an ocean view in Vancouver. They never had a return address, but they meant he was all right and he was thinking about me. Then they stopped. I should sail off to find him. No, if he really loves me, he'll come back. Mr. Schmidt, are you okay? You've been looking out. Is there something wrong in the parking lot? The dog is still barking. Mrs. Franklin has appeared, materialized in front of my desk. Maybe she learned that from Big Schmidt. I came downstairs for dinner one Sunday and found him in my father's chair. I'm still staring at the snowbank. Nothing's changed. No wind, no movement. Everything's frozen. Mrs. Franklin rubs the side of her skirt, almost in time with her words. I have to get this back to the other mister. Just put it on the desk. I'll sign it in a minute. Thanks. The past wins another tug of war. I fall back into that October afternoon. My clenched fingers tap dad's jackknife against the shed door just above the O in C-J-O-H-Q. Sometimes I'd cover that letter with my thumb and pretend I had a radio station, C-J-H-Q. Instead of top 40 hits, I'd play the bottom 60, the ones that needed help. Jason, the pie's getting cold. If you don't hurry up, your brother will eat all the filling. Keith Schmidtface isn't my brother. The voice that erupted from my belly echoed in the shed, but didn't reach the house. Practice makes perfect. I knew Keith was gobbling down the filling from the pumpkin I grew. Then he'd stretch his mouth in a smile that looked painful and ridiculous, his I annoyed Jason smile. Mom said he was just being a six-year-old when he drew a clown face with permanent marker over the five on my headboard. I grabbed Dad's saw and a board left over from the treehouse he built for me. Keith was spending more time there than I did. Mom and his father agreed that we'd feel like brothers if we shared it. I grasped the wood when the saw teeth bit through its surface. I remembered my father's muscles tensing and flexing. He cut two by fours in half as if they were cardboard. The saw stopped. It was stuck. No matter how hard I pushed, I couldn't make it move. It's 3.42. The other Mr. Schmidt needs it by four o'clock. I know. Keith isn't the other Mr. Schmidt. He's the only Mr. Schmidt now that his father's dead. I'm Mr. McNally. Every time I sign Jason Schmidt, part of me is 10. The tool shed is a ship sailing after my father. He promised we'd build a model without a kit and carve Jason and the Argonauts on the side. Mrs. Franklin glances at my fist. 
It's pinning the contract to my desk as if I expected it to run away. I I'm sorry, Mrs. Frankel. Her eyes are half closed. I appreciate your apology. I'd appreciate your signature even more. Mrs. Franklin is a force of nature, like gravity, something that you don't think about much but can't live without. You know how important this is to the company. A lot of people envy me for inheriting a business, a half a business. Some even think I'm good at my job, junior partner. Mom likes to say, your father would be so proud of you. She means Henry Schmidt would be proud. Oh, not as much as when Keith and his wife had a son. Well, she doesn't say that. She doesn't need to. There's no shame in being 34 and single. I'm not sure which of us she's trying harder to convince. Every time I listen to Little Schmidt's we need to be the city's number one construction company speech, my index finger traces get me out of here along the oak grain of my desk. I want to build a new one, feel the soft but firm wood, fit the pieces together with mathematical precision, say, I made something beautiful with my hands, not I negotiated the contract for a parking garage. You've got 10 minutes, Mr. Schmidt. Mrs. Franklin's bomb countdown needs a dig red digital time display and a series of echoing ticks. I think of the wind-up clock on Mum's kitchen table with its rusting metal and loud guts. Dad's parents bought it. He didn't take it with him when he left. I had to beg Mum not to throw it out. It ended up in the shed, the shed, that October afternoon. I tried again and again to pull the saw out of the board. A muscle in my arm felt ready to burst through skin. Dad could do it. At least I could handle his jackknife. After the Schmitz invaded, Mom asked me over and over to carve Keith's name on the treehouse door. It was easier to give in than to keep arguing. Just like when I turned 18, I know you can change your name back now, but Henry's here and your father isn't. Just like when I joined the family business. I can still feel it, the saw stuck in the wood. I, I imagine my father's hand on mine. We pull out the saw and hold it high in the air. I turn to smile at him to say that Arthur has freed Excalibur from the rock, but he isn't there. The saw hasn't moved. Five minutes, Mr. Schmidt. I trace a five on my desktop with two fingers, a horizontal slash, tick, tick, a vertical slash, tick, tick, the slow release of a curve as a ship eases its way around dangerous rocks. Keith appears in the doorway. What's the hold up, bro? My eyelids know his voice. They shut him out and shut me in. Images flash by, each striking more quickly than the next, like lightning from an approaching storm. My mother's head lowers when I say I don't want to be a Schmidt anymore. My father drinks alone in a prairie city, far from ocean views that he can't afford. Keith makes a toast at my retirement party. He says, Jason loved working with his brother all these years as a fire in my chest burns away whatever's left there. It's $10 million. Keith always gets louder when he talks about money. Do you want to lose the project? Jason, are you just going to sit there? I slowly rise and press my hands against, against the desk. I'm going to do what I should have done a long time ago. The muscles in my right arm tense. My fingers seem to grip a saw, become part of it, cut wood as if it's cardboard. I'm ready for a quest, whatever it turns out to be. Mrs. Franklin's mouth opens, but she can't speak. I grasp the contract, almost crumpling it and sign scrawl Jason Schmidt for the last time. Keith jumps back when I throw it at him. The doorway is clear. In a movement of surprising grace, I cross the room. I curve around Mrs. Franklin and the filing cabinet. The air parts on either side of me. I take a deep breath and sail through the doorway's narrow passage. The ocean ahead of me stretches as far as I can see. Thank you. That was fantastic. 
I have been really enjoying my conversations with Donald. We spent some time on Zoom talking back and forth about his manuscripts, his short stories. So I want to remind you before we go any further that if you have any short stories that you would like to share with me, any poetry, um, maybe the first couple of pages from a novel, or even you just want to talk about writing, come and talk to me. I'm looking forward to working with all of you. And speaking of fantastic writers, um, I have Delane Just next on my um, event today. So Delane Just is a current MFA and writing student at the University of Saskatchewan. Delane's current uh, Shirk funding proposal is a thesis, which is a collection of short stories centering around the experiences of Canadian millennial women and LGBTQ plus individuals. I leave you with the fantastic work of Delane Just. Hi everyone, it's great to be here in some capacity today. I'm going to be reading a short story work in progress called Beats Per Minute Miles Per Hour for you today. It's a short fiction piece, so I'll get right to it. Thank you for having me. Mallory Fry stretched her large legs for a moment before turning the keys in the ignition and leaning into the roaring grumble of the bus around her. She pat the steering wheel fondly, like a child. Cold won't get us down yet, she said. The heat was cranked for Saskatchewan windshield, and the windshield wipers were quick and ready for the snowfall. She pulled out from the garage and around into the street. It was the start of her day, 5 a.m., and the sky was still dark and the bus was still empty. Just the rumble and grumble of a motorized engine, the squeak and scrape of the windshield, the muffled singing of Stevie Nicks on the Rock 85 radio. The first couple stops were peopleless as usual, small neighborhood stops. As she followed the road nearer and nearer to the main intersection, Main and Birch, more people began to pile on in. A few early rising students carrying gym bags and sneakers, as if a couple trips to the college gym would get them fresh and fit. A tall blonde who looked annoyingly slim and perky, even in boxy blue scrubs. A balding man with a shining watch beneath the sleeve on his wrist that he kept checking and tapping his foot to each tick. Their time was now in her hands, their schedules moving in time with the press of her foot on the gas. Oh, the ripples she'd make when the brake came too fast and their bodies would sway and crash into each other. The clattering of footfall as they regained their balance. Quiet sorries and excuse me's. She turned onto Maine a bit too fast, relishing in the confusion of the passengers, then proceeded down the street, stopping a few times every few blocks. The bus was getting quite crowded by now and she had to yell back a couple times for people to shift on back. They liked to crowd by the doors or the front and huddle together, but not touching. Never touching. Mallory hated when the bus got this full. It'd get too close to her. Some would try to make small talk, to which she'd just, mm-hmm, and, humph. <laughs> she hated the busy hours, hated the humid body heat that filled the bus. Babies weeping and mothers hushing pathetically. Students talking in hushed voices that weren't actually that quiet at all. And finally, she was at the end of it all, Birch and Maine. Second last stop before the last terminal and sweet five-minute rest stop, Freedom. There was only one set of lights and one single car in front of her. She tapped her finger to the edge of 17, puncturing the hoo-hoo-hoos into the steering wheel. The light turned green and she revved up, ready to get the hell out of there. But the car in front of her wasn't moving. Oh, hell, she muttered. Fucking Texan drivers never paying any attention. She honked, smacking her hand down hard on the horn. The howl of the horn blared into the early morning dim like a foghorn. She waited a moment. Another? But the car didn't even let go of their brake. She honked again, sharper, angrier, letting it yell like a yowling dog. 
then another few times for good measure. But nothing. The car didn't move an inch. For fuck's sake. The red of the brake lights reflected on the thick flesh of her face, an angry, fleshy pink. Her lips were pulled so tight you could barely see them under the heft of her chin and nose. Chatter started up from the back of the bus. Little whispers of which she could only catch bits and pieces. Is going on? Is crazy? Mallory closed her eyes, pushed air from her nostrils like an ox, hiked up her trousers, and got up from her seat with a grunt. She pulled the lever next to her seat and the door squealed, metal on metal. The air pushed in, cold like the water of a winter beach. She trudged outside, one foot at a time, heavy and exaggerated as if the movement itself would frighten the other drivers into tailing it out of there. The bus creaked as she stepped off, rocked a bit on its rubber wheels. The cold crept under her clothes. Her skin prickled red and dry and angry like a burn. She imagined what she was going to say. If you can't fucking drive, get off the fucking road. I got a bus full of people. I don't have time for this shit. We run on a schedule, you know. I'ma be at the college at 6 a.m. and not a moment later than that. But when she neared the window, the anger blew out from her chest. The man in the car looked up at her, clouded by the glossy golden sheen of the morning streetlight on the window. His whole face seized by some invisible pain. One hand squeezed at the fabric over his chest. The other steadied him on the wheel, knuckles white. Air was wheezing in and out through his bared teeth. Mallory went cold. She wondered how that could even be since she could no longer feel her own body. She knew she was supposed to do something, something, something. But what was she supposed to do? He caught her eye. His mouth moved. Help, it seemed to say. Her hand was in her pocket, then to her ear. She barely felt it move. Then, a voice. 911, what's your emergency? Words that weren't her own poured from lips she couldn't feel. Heart, heart attack. I, I think he's having a heart attack. Ma'am, I need your location. What's your location? Oh God, I, he's having a heart attack, isn't he? Ma'am, please give me your location. He, he's... Location, uh, where are we? I'm a bus driver. I know this area. I... Bridge Street. We're closing in on Bridge Street from Maine, near the cross. You know, the four-way? And what's your name? Mallory. Uh, last name, too? Mallory Fry. Okay, ma'am. I need you to stay with me, all right? Take a deep breath. In, then out. There you go. Ambulance has been ditch dispatched. I just need you to stay with him, okay? If there's an aspirin nearby, have him chew one if he's not allergic to it. Oh, God, he... I don't think he's awake anymore. He, he was awake just a moment ago. Now his eyes are closed and his hands have fallen and... Ma'am, I need you just to calm down and follow my instructions. Do you understand? I... Yes, I... Okay, yes. All right, I'm gonna need you to check if he's breathing, okay? Wait ten seconds, see if he's breathing. He's not, he's not breathing, I... All right, Mallory, I'm going to need you to perform CPR. Can you do that for me? Follow my directions exactly. Hand over hand, pressure to the beat of staying alive. Count to thirty, two breaths, breathe, breathe. She doesn't hear the sirens till the arms are around her moving her aside. They need her to ride with them, they say. Relay the situation. She thought about the bus she left behind. People who must have been talking, yelling at each other, confused, calling the bus station to yell at them too. But the bus and precarity of her job were far away now. And what was real was the man in the mask, the heaving and shaking breaths that filled the plastic mask with small clouds of fog, the bump, the sway of the road, the calm words of the responders, 
the sun that began to rise from behind the towering buildings they barreled past. Flashes of hazy amber and shadow. And she wasn't really there, riding in the back of that ambulance anymore, was she? She was somewhere above everything, watching from the ceiling, watching her own large hands grip each other tightly. The hard line of her eyebrow, the sweat running down the back of her neck, listening to the mechanical beep of another's life. And that was my story, Miles Per Hour Beats Per Minute. Thank you all for listening and again for the opportunity to be here. And thank you so much. And my final guest for the night, tonight, right after we finish with the name just, is Ian Cannon. Ian Cannon sent me the first uh, couple of chapters from his upcoming novel and I loved it. So I cannot wait for you to hear the first couple of chapters from there. Uh, Ian Cannon is the author of It's a Long Way Down, which was released in 2018, and Before Oblivion, which was released in 2017. His second novel, What We Do on Weekends, which is a fantastic title, is forthcoming. His stories have been featured in The Junction, The Sunlight Press, Spadina Literature Review, The Creative Cafe, Montreal Writes, Fonz Polaroids, and he has been profiled for fall. He is currently in the midst of his MFA in writing from the University of Saskatchewan. God knows I know how difficult the work of an MFA. I just graduated from one, so thank you for sharing with us, Ian, and I look forward to sharing your art with those folks. Take it away. I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my novel, What We Do on Weekends, about a man's weekend-long Mildly surreal search for purpose instigated by a letter guaranteeing that he'll be dead by Monday morning. As he looks for who wrote the letter, he visits his old haunts and navigates the seedy underbelly of Nowhere City. Uh, so let's begin. Chapter 1 is called A Purgatory of Quarks at 4.41 p.m. on Friday. All of us wished we didn't have to watch the clock on Friday afternoon, counting down the minutes until we felt the freedom fall upon our bodies. We've all seen it. The clock ticks down and it makes the common man's hair, arm hair, stand at attention. Their swollen hearts pulse a little faster, 5.30 on a Friday, when the collective breath of millions of Americans releases and the minds of working men and women clear for nearly 72 hours. It is the unknown unfurled in front of them and bursting with potential. But we are presented with a choice. Do we squander that freedom or do we plan our escape? Theodore Winston Glick, while watching the second hand clock of, of while watching the second hand of a clock tumble towards 5.30 p.m., didn't know that this was a choice. As a result, he failed to make a choice, which is to say he chose by default the former. He was a 21st century factory worker in Nowhere, USA the back broken through bending, sorting quarks from cranks on a computer he didn't understand and counting down the minutes until he could go home. It was often said from people who did not work on his floor that his place was a workplace, was the marketplace of ideas, where everything happened because nothing happened and saying everything was better than nothing. His floor consisted of 155,236 cubicles, 394 man-made prison squared, and smelled faintly of burning dreams. Miles away on the other side of the office floor, between the intermittent sounds of 100,000 telephones, a woman weeped. He wanted to get up to find her, to hold her in his arms and weep together, to tell her everything was, was going to be okay, that he understood her pain, that they were in this together, and together they would find a way out. But it was 4.41 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, in a distilled office air office without air conditioning, and he was behind on the infinite number of made-up symbols he had to sort for some phantom in an ivory tower. He took a sip of poison water, covered the time on his computer screen with a sticky note, and slipped in name brand overpriced earbuds. He moved one quark here, one crank there, and the rare periwinkle, Jesuit, or fang doodle somewhere. Then the last two were not his responsibility, but he liked to keep the assembly line of nothingness, the all day toll twinkle interesting. As interesting as finding an oddly shaped purple pebble would be while counting sand in the Sahara, lost and thirsty. As he worked, Music slipping from ear to ear, making love at the center of his brain, 
He bit the inside of his cheek, tapped the keyboard in strange foreign patterns, sighed, and bit his fingernails. He dropped each particulate on a screen into their proper location, stopping inter intermittently to run a hand through his side parted, dirty blonde hair. The shave under undercut, stabbing into the meat of his hand. A single sort sorted. It was a type of sort that would be ogled out if noticed. It was a kind of sort that would be written up as exemplary and passed from screen to screen. That sword led to a second and then a third, but not a fourth. Just as he was getting his rhythm, right before he would have inevitably flipped into his flow state and the last remaining minutes of the work week would have evaporated, a nasally voice cut through the air. Theo stopped and looked up. Mr. Glick, it repeated. He removed his earbuds and swiveled in his chair. Standing at the corner of his cubicle was his boss, pressing his thumbs against the leather straps of his suspenders. Mr. Donaldson? All around him was the sound of rustling paper, the scurrying of feet, the closing of laptops. The great office herd was attempting its, its escape while Theo, the lone, water, the lone African water buffalo, would be eaten alive by the jackals from up above. I'd love a word, Mr. Donaldson said, pushing thick-rimmed bifocals up his nose and running a hand through greasy, middle-parted air, ostensibly unaware of the weekend migration occurring all around him. A man on the other side of the office, far behind Mr. Donaldson, saluted Theo for his sacrifice as he opened the window and nosedived into the open air of the 88th floor. What can I do for you, Theo said, watching the man in the distance open his parachute and float to safety. Those Thompson reports, do you have them yet? I thought you weren't, I thought they weren't, <clears throat> Theo cleared his throat. Do on your desk until Monday morning. That's right. A man in puke brown, a man in a puke brown suit crawled on his stomach behind Mr. Donaldson. He looked up at Theo and held a finger to his lips, sweat lined the wrinkles of his forehead. They weren't, Mr. Donaldson said. Did something change? Mr. Donaldson breathed in, expanded his cheeks as if he were holding in a secret, and then let it all out. Spittle and refuse blew against Theo's face like he were on the fibered end of a juicer. The thing is, I got word from upstairs, and I'm really in a bind here, Ted. They're going to, you know, need them today. Theo looked back at his computer screen, then back at Mr. Donaldson. It's after five. I, I, don't, I really don't think I can get them done before I leave for the weekend. Well, Mr. Donaldson winced, clenching his corn-colored teeth. You know, if I'm being honest, which you know I pride myself on being honest to my staff, it's one of my greatest managerial strengths. Among many, as you well know, I also believe in being firm when a time calls for it, and fair when gentleness will do. You've experienced both many times, haven't you, Ted? I, I guess. And uh, what was I saying? The Thompson reports. That's right. The reports, and your inability to do them before 5.30, on the dot, before you uh, leave for the weekend. We're going to need you to, you know, stay a little after work. Later, Troy, at snail and men's clothing, that alien from upper management, took his thumbs out of his suspenders and leaned into Theo's ear, his lips almost inside his cochlear duck. Later, he whispered as if he extended his tongue into the canal, slithering directly up into Theo's brain, the breath hot and damp, smelling like rotting coffee beans. He straightened his back and put a hand to his chin, rubbing the now five o'clock shadow. That's not going to be a problem, is it? Well, I had, I had plans to... It'll be to, you know, six, six thirty, uh, seven. He let the sibilant sounds dry out in long, forlorn spaces. Whatever you had planned can probably wait a little longer. Theo crossed his arms and looked down at the floor. He imagined, just for a second, standing up and towering over the managerial maggot, taking him by the head and smashing it into his computer over and over, sorting his brain and bile from bits and bone until there was nothing left but a cowardly stump. Instead, he looked up and swallowed and said, Okay. Okay? If that's what you want me to do, sir, I'm your guy. Mr. Donaldson's smile was so smug, so self-congratulatory, that Theo had to clench his fists and hold back his demons. He winked at Theo. You are my guy, Ted. Okay, Mr. Johnson. And you can be sure Corporal will hear about who was the rising star who rose to the occasion. And that rising star, Theo knew, would be Mr. Johnson. You and Corporate can count on me. Don't mention it. Theo turned away from Mr. Johnson, back to his computer. He put his fingers on his keyboard, stopped, then looked back at the slug still loitering around his desk. Uh, anything else? All right, uh, sure, the man said, backing away from the desk. You've got a lot of work to do still. I'll let you, you know, get back to it. 
He turned and walked away, a jovial whistle following close behind him. Thanks for stopping by, Theo said. Once Mr. Donaldson was miles from his desk, he added, I'll see you Monday, you bastard. That you will, a voice echoed across the room. Theo shot out of his chair. He picked up a pair of his desk binoculars and saw a full mile and a half away, Mr. Donaldson standing at the elevator checking his phone. Theo's pupils were doing loops from one end of the office to the other, looking for answers, but it was, by now, deserted. The doors to the elevator opened and Theo was the last man or woman in the office, an island in an ocean of desks. Chapter 2, Another Weekend to Squander 6.01 p.m. Friday Theo sat back down in his computer chair, his cheeks crimson and warm, and the world outside of work shrinking away. It would be another hour or two of hell, doing nothing work for men he didn't know, the shadows roaming the long towers, moving chess pieces of massive sums of made-up money. He bit back into his now raw lip and looked at the blinking cursor on his screen. It was taunting him, screaming at him, laughing at him. One more hour. He moved his mouse towards the Thompson Files, then paused. He thought about the dreads who pummel their way through the world. He saw them on the surface, their hair neatly set in place, their clothes ironed, looking like a directed group of people with purpose and places to be. But when he looked closer into the soft gelatin of their eyes, he could see that most of them, himself included, belonged to a certain class of human that inter interprets the weekday, the work week, as nothing more than the world tying their hands behind their back and slamming a fist into a doughy gut until the taste of copper stick on their tongues. For that, he thought, we all feel a certain animosity towards the majority of our lives. It is our belief, simply because we are alive, that we are owed more than this bare-bone survival from Monday to Friday, each day ticking by in 60-second intervals, 480 daily minutes. It's a purgatory, a floating in the void, as if we wait idly for that special something that fills the space between when we leave and when we sleep. For most of us, idle is the awkward word here. We do not seek out purpose, but let it find us. Hope it finds us. Every week we wake up, shower, shit, put our pants on one foot at a time, and attempt to fit in with our work clothes and our work face surrounded by the world of fitter -itters. This is what we call freedom, the inevitable result of progress. Nothing jobs for nothing people, and nothing stood before him on a 21-inch computer screen. He clenched down and looked around his desk. There was a pencil standing up in his pen holder. The tip was newly sharpened. It shimmered in the dim office light, calling out to him. He wanted to drive that pencil into his knee to scream out in pain, if only to make something happen. Instead, he sighed it and opened the Thompson Files. As he sorted, shifting corks around his small universe, his mind drifted to a study he once saw. In a paper or a documentary, or maybe it was a late-night internet session while wearing two-day-old underwear. That proved just that. The pain was preferable to boredom. In this study, subjects were left alone in an empty room for an indefinite amount of time with a button that said, Do not touch me. Faced with boredom, they would venture forth into, an, uh, into the unknown, victims of curiosity, which has regularly been blamed for the killing of cats, but has found a more consistent victim in the Homo sapien. The subject would inspect the button before their fateful, their, their inexorable push of it. Once pushed, the subject received a small yet irrefutably painful shock. However, and this is where things would get interesting, the patient, Theo too, we could call him, would snap back from the button, smile at his own stupidity, and return to his seat. Once there, he would find himself, or a friendly hero, without much to think or do. He would steal a glance at the button in its big red glory, insidious as it is in the corner, and before long, it would begin to call to him, the sole stimulus in the room. He would get up and walk close to the button. He would inspect it again. Laughing, he would say to himself, no, 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 and sit back down. Or, maybe, he would convince himself that the pain the first time wasn't so bad, or that he couldn't quite remember how bad it was, and the only way to find out would be to go through the whole ordeal again. And so, the subject, or dear Theo too, gets up, walks bravely over to the button, and gives it a gallant and convincing press, sending electricity through his body by way of the nervous system. What a glory it is to feel something. He drifted back to the front, to the work in front of him. The man made labor, the nothing job. He began to burn through the sorts like the perfect sorting machine he was. One, two, three, onto a thousand, and on and on, a million sorts a minute, an hour, a day, onto infinity. What a perfect sorting machine he was. Behind closed doors, they called him God's gift to upper management with a single directive, sort, sort, sort. Sorting was a task, and the title of sorter was on his CV. But it was a flow state he was after, the flow state that, in some ways, all men are after. It is a moment of clarity where you lose yourself in a task and when even, where even the most boring activities become not tedium but a way of life. 
That same finger that touched upon the world, its power of creation, seems to come down from the sky and touch upon your skull, moving you to the power of creation and the rest of the world melts away. The moment is pure, but it's also quantum. In, the, in that observation of its effect, awareness of the moment will inevitably destroy it. The rest of the world comes back into focus in you, the observer, the subject, the ever-experimental participant in day-to-day -day life snap out of it. Having come out the other side, Theo leaned back in his stiff computer chair, shook out his fingers, and admired the magic that made up the pixels on the screen. There was another hour, hour and a half left on the Thompson Files, and he didn't know if he could make it. In fact, he didn't know if he cared if he made it. A thought, more warming than a last, popped into his head. As he adopted a thousand-yard stare, he pondered, at the, he pondered the consequences of leaving a job undone. They would still be there, waiting for him on Monday. Monday, not a pleasant thought. And sure, there would be trouble if he left now, but there would also be the weekend. And like most of the Western world, the Theo was a man of now, now, now. That was what defined his weekends, what defined all our weekends, the search for now. It was what consumed us on a Friday afternoon. It was what moved Theo to log out of his computer at 6.33 p.m. With a, with a sense of satisfaction, he stood up, tucked his white dress shirt back into his dress pants, and made his way to the escape pole. The copper pole, polished by use, ran from Theo's current position on the 88th floor all the way to the ground floor, the elevator's reserved for management. He slipped his hand into the pair of thick leather safety gloves from a pile in a wooden crate before turning back to take one last look over the barren, cold landscape of a cubicle desert. He gave it a final salute, grasped the pole, and slid down to the bottom floor. The silence of the office room was replaced by a screech. The parking lot, miles of painted asphalt, was big enough to be moonlighting as an airport runway. Theo crossed it under the evening sun. The air was dry and silent. Theo's vehicle was a barely serviceable 2001 hatchback. The rust delicately placed among the faded orange and part of the back bumper was crushed in. Behind him, the steel of his office building soared more than seven miles into the sky, clouds covering the top of the building. There was always cloud cover, as if geo-engineered to hide the home of the higher-ups. If the clouds were, the, were to recede, if the heavens were peeled back, there would be, left in their place, an all-seeing eye, like the eye of Baradul, the little, lidless eye, the great eye of capitalism, money's manifestation burning bright in the sky. He slipped into his driver's side, instinctively avoiding a spring that popped through the seat's material eons ago and started the car. It sounded like a, fall, a failing wind-up toy sorting its own cranks and quarks under an aged engine, stuttering before it started. He put it into gear and pulled out of the parking lot. The drive home used to be a moment of building excitement for Theo. As he drove along the Hope River, surrounded by smoking stacks of refuse, he would imagine an endless series of possibilities spread out before him. Weekends were an all-you-can-eat buffet at the World's Fair. Turning onto the 11-lane highway in downtown Nora, now in his sights, it would look like it was bursting at the seams, just waiting for him to break it open and sip from his weekend juices. He'd light a cigarette, unroll the window, and push the pedal down, racing headfirst into the unknown. By the time he turned down the narrow brick streets of, a down, of downtown, he'd be half cut on anticipation alone, knowing full well that there would be a leak, lick of sleep until Sunday. 182 days ago, that all changed. A spell of sobriety had overtaken Theo. Now a sober hermit, the weekend held only the possibility of bad television, takeout, and refined sugars. His street was littered with brownstone townhouses surrounded two surrounding two mid-side apartments, one brick, one steel. They rose up from the townhouses like two peaks of a castle, a back alley moat running between the two of them. His was a brick building, called the Pie. He parked in the, on the, in the only available spot and stepped out into the open air, which smelled of urban renewal, the mysteries of wet asphalt. The front of the building was covered by a green walkway canopy. It was as if someone put up, squinted at it with cross, it was as, as, it was as if someone put it up, squinted at it with crossed arms and decided that they rightfully had no business redesigning this building. Too scared to ruin it further, they decided it was simply best to leave it up. He followed the canopy in his lobby, the smell of empty milk cartons in the air, to his crank-operated elevator. You had to go through a six-week course just to run the damn thing, and every tenant was a fully licensed elevator operator. He cranked it all the way to number eight, and it quaked upwards, oil bleeding down from the corners. At his floor, he leaped across the interstice, landing his, on his hands and tucking and rolling as the elevator free fell behind him. He stood up, brushed himself off, and continued down the hall. His was the last in the narrow corridor overlooking the alley. He shared, a, he shared a wall with a beetle of a man, a feisty Spaniard who lived in a stained wife beater tucked into sweats and never had a shortage of exotic women strolling through the halls. As he stepped up to his apartment, marked 808 in brass lettering, he could hear one of the women now shouting at him in a mix of English and Spanish, hard F's and S's. Theo leaned towards the sound, but above piercing expletives, nothing of substance reached his ears. He unlocked his door and stepped inside. As he took his first step into his apartment and his legs rocketed above his head and he came, 
As he took his first step into the apartment, his legs rocketed above his head, and he came down hard on his tailbone. He withered on the ground, pain shooting down his legs, wondering what had just happened. He moved a hand towards his tailbone, hoping to push his spine back into place, but instead made contact with a foreign object. He pulled it out to find a letter in an envelope. It was marked with a kiss, the word Destiny writ handwritten in blue ink. Someone had placed it under his front door, waiting for him to come home. That was the first two chapters of my novel, What We Do on Weekends. Thank you. And that's all the fun for today, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you to Donald, to Delaney, and to Ian for uh, sharing their fantastic art with all of us today. Um, I am also thankful for the Saskatoon Public Library for offering me this space to um, give you some of the up-and-coming authors uh, from Saskatchewan. Um, and again, if you are interested in my feedback about your writing, send it to me on uh, the uh, Public Library's website. And also, if you're interested in being part of the Public Salon, this is an open call to everybody. Come and join me in the Public Salon. I would be happy to read your work. And then, if you're selected, you will record a video just like those fantastic folks. And I will introduce you and we'll share it on the social medias of the Saskatoon Public Library. For now, that was the Public Salon. And I look forward to seeing you around the socials. Bye.